Welcome Sharon McGee, a nationally certified counselor and one uh, with a reputation for being particularly insightful and effective with young people, with adolescents. And since there's a lot of parents and grandparents out there that are very concerned right now about their tweens and teens uh, during the pandemic, I thought we could have a brief conversation and you could help us understand uh, what these kids are going through. So developmentally, uh, adolescents are already feeling things. Can you help us understand uh, what they're already going through? Sure. Thanks for asking me, Sharon. Um, so it's a wonderful time. It can be a wonderful time of adolescence, you know, and often filled with conflicting feelings, good feelings. Everything is sort of at a 90 degree um, edge. Uh, but I think of it as a time of new environments, new experiences, and also new opportunities. Um, life is like a laboratory for the adolescent. You know, they go in, they either interact or they run into some challenges and they create an idea of who they are. But this pull to connect with peers is the central developmental task of adolescence. And uh, in these particular times, things have become, become quite challenging for many adolescents. Now, is it my imagination or does every generation see, say this rather, that children seem to be reaching this sort of teen uh, level at younger years. Uh, and I assume it's social media, they're never off their devices. But is it still really, we're talking about 12 to 16, 17, what are we talking about here? Well, from a research standpoint, people often will lump from 10 through the teenage years as the time of adolescence. And it's, it's it, give or take one or two years with each individual. But I think to your point, I would agree, Sharon, that the impact of uh, social media and also a 24 hour news cycle, there's just tremendous more uh, awareness, I would say, of the outside world. And it does inform young people, but one of the most reassuring things I believe about working with young people over these last 30 years, 35 years, is that developmentally, they are still where they should be. That they can learn information, but that information comes to them often in a vacuum. And they will adapt because the pressure is to grow and everyone does comment. However, internally, the same drives, the same tasks must be accomplished in order for them to remain healthy. Okay. Enter the pandemic last spring and schools are open, they're closed, they're half time, they're virtual. What is this doing to uh, teens? Well, I think that primarily we have to acknowledge the central role that schools do play for, for children and adolescents, as well as college age students as well. That they really create a frame for the young person. It is actually, in many cases, the laboratory. It's the, it's the actual walls of the laboratory for the student. Uh, I don't know any student that I'm working with or have worked with recently over this last period of eight months that is not having some challenge relative to either a hybrid situation or completely virtual. Um, the isolation that that creates, you know, the independent study that it creates for many young people is just very, very difficult to get over. Um, again, not having that context, that formational um, context to understand yourself and your peers in addition to the schooling that takes place, you know, the learning that happens that is social, emotional, as well as cognitive and behavioral is not taking place in the wholeness of the classroom as it was before. And it's very challenging and discouraging for some. And of course, for low income kids, uh, it's particularly brutal where they may not have adequate Wi-Fi or they're uh, crowded into a smaller space uh, where they can't really have any privacy, which adolescents crave, of course, to uh, concentrate and do their schoolwork. How can we help 
the young people we love? I think there needs to be, first of all, listening. I am a big believer in listening. Just simply allowing the young person to vent, uh, to be able to acknowledge what they're saying, reflect back to them that I get it. You know, I get what you're saying. But also in our minds, those who support young people to remember that they're resilient. The thing that's most hopeful about this, even in the most dire situations, is that children want to learn. They want to for things to improve and they believe that they can do it. And we should back them up. A lot of times during this pandemic, particularly um, people that I am working with are really creative in terms of finding something that they love to do, getting back in touch with journaling, you know, but being outside is a contradiction to all of the restrictive measures that are now upon us at once again, uh, relative to the pandemic. Being outside in nature lowers uh, the anxiety level. It is very reassuring to actually move large muscle movement. So you would suggest that uh, we get our kids off the devices, ha ha, good luck with that one, and outside, what are you saying? Yeah, Walk, I am. Bike uh, ride? Everything, all of, the, all of the above, all activities outside. And it, it, it's a negotiation, it's a conversation. I think that we as adults forget that we're negotiating this with our children. You know, we're, we can't just lay down the law and say, well, you must get off the device. But being able to have a conversation about what you're seeing and thinking and what they can reflect back to you about their experience. Actually, many of the things that I just mentioned were solutions that young people came to themselves because after five, six hours on the computer for school, um, they've had it, you know, and interactions with peers via Zoom, via FaceTime are limited because the spontaneity that they enjoy and the different levels of interaction are just not there mm -hmm. uh, on a Zoom call or on a FaceTime call. I know a lot of them are on in the middle of the night. Uh, I mean, on their digital devices. I, I think a lot of parents and grandparents would like to hear what your advice is on how to, if it's possible at all, frame that or control that in some way. Yeah, again, I think a conversation, but also policy setting is really important. That the importance of having a healthy circadian rhythm is, is key here because without that, you get into uh, higher levels of depression and anxiety. And so agreeing that some parents do take the device off of the child, you know, at, at night because they, they know that themselves that they cannot just themselves turn it off and leave it there. So that is something that I do think is an important conversation. I think policy setting around that is important, really because of the overall health of the individual is at stake. Okay, Sharon, and maybe because these are short interviews, a final question, when, when are the indicators there that say, oops, we need some professional help? You know, yeah. this is more than I as a mother or a grandmother can handle. When, when is it time to seek help? Yeah, well, I think that one of the things you're looking for are changes in daily habits, you know, not bathing, uh, you know, being isolated, not willing to come down, changes in sleeping habits, uh, activities that once were interesting to them are completely something that they don't want to do. Many of us can tell just by the low mood and asking someone, engaging with them. A lot of times when depression is on the, uh, on the table, we are so hesitant to bring it up because we're afraid that you know, young people are suggestible and we don't want them to you know, get into a jam or think they're depressed and it's really not that important. If you gut, your gut tells you that this person is not functioning the way they did, even with all of the things that we're talking about during the pandemic, that it's a, it's a conversation with them and it's important to reach out to a mental health professional. So keep talking, keep asking questions, observe, get them outside, make a policy around the digital devices. And to reassure them that this too shall pass. I think your, our sense of hope is an important thing to share with them. And for us, all of us who, our caregivers of young people and support young people to remember 
they're resilient. Lend them your kindness, lend them your resiliency and your calmness. And uh, I did just think of something else I'd like to ask you. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of chatter about kids being behind in school because of this setup. Will they catch up? I mean, is this so dire or? Uh, it is not, well, it's, a, it's important for schools to monitor that. And every school has a different read, but uh, the schools that I have been actually most recently in contact with, surprisingly, when they do their um, testing, they do periodic testing of students, that this last test that would be given in September, um, that was measuring what happened in the spring, actually the children did okay. They, they weren't killing it. They weren't, you know, doing exemplary, but they did stay what was considered at a baseline where they should be at that time in their development. The, the good news and the bad news is, is that yes, there's not, the learning that was happening previously is not happening qualitatively the way it was before, but everyone is in the same boat everyone. And so teachers, administrators, school personnel will do everything they can because it's in their interest and in the interest of their students to bring people back up to where they should be. And again, uh, having been affiliated with education uh, most of my life, I can say that without a doubt that children will come back. Again, that idea of resilience and those who need support will get probably the best support that they need to move forward. Sharon McGee, thank you so very much. Anything else you would like to tell us before we conclude our conversation? Just really one quick thing is just how important it is for parents to support each other. Parents, grandparents, those who are caregivers of young people. This is such important work. And everything that you say and do makes a huge difference to your children. I see that. They bring that to me when I work with them. And I'm greatly appreciative of that. All right. Well, thank you so much. And I'll be checking back with you. All right. That sounds great. Thanks so much. Stay safe.